pawn to d4 and pawn to d5. Hello and welcome to a chess chess. And here we have another immortal game. A real beauty and a sound beauty. Uh, well, of course, sound, 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 immortal, immortal, immortal. It's an ASMR video, so it's about, it's about sound, but it's also about a sound chess game. Um, so, knight to f3 and e6. Normally, when I make these videos, I I let you have the winning side, and usually that is white also. But for this particular video, uh, we are actually mostly concerned about black's strategy, because with black we see an absolute titan of uh, the early era of professional chess. Akiba Rubinstein. Or actually Akiva. Everybody writes Akiba Rubinstein now. But actually, if you look at tournament scores from the early 1900s, he spelled his name with a W, not with a B. Akiva Rubinstein. Anyways, he's with the black pieces and he's playing against. Rod Levy, a Polish champion in 1907, and this is the Rubinstein Immortal. And the reason that I turned it around is to give you uh, a chance to sort of mix it up and see what it feels like to, to see it from the other side. And because... Um, Rubinstein had a very interesting relationship with the black pieces. So there is a story that one day at a tournament, another grandmaster asked uh, Rubinstein, so okay, who are you playing today? Who will you be playing against? Uh, and he answered that Today, I will be playing against the fact that I have the black pieces. So, the way he looked at chess was like interesting. It was, he was interested in the truth of chess, how to play sound, correct chess, and the fact that white starts with the first move gives an advantage to white, and that was what he was concerned about more than who the actual player was. Akiva was one of the first um, grandmasters who played correct chess. We had Morphy, we had Adolf Anderson and the guys before them, Steinitz, and they could play beautiful games, but they were riddled with mistakes and errors that later analysis have shown this sacrifices on sound because of this and that. Akiva was a sound player, he played very sensible chess and he didn't make those mistakes. And also he was the first endgame maestro. So you could think, okay, his his immortal game, if he's an end game maestro, and if this is like this correct player that doesn't make mistakes, then it's probably not a wild tactical game with a lot of sacrifices. But you would be wrong. This is an absolutely crazy game. And the most crazy part is that it is all completely sound. Pawn to e3. Pawn to c5, pawn to 
to C4, knight to C6, and knight to C3, followed by knight to F6. So if you notice, now we have a symmetrical position, but we didn't play the moves in a symmetrical fashion. First Akiva played this, then he played that. So he was doing a skirmish, a little dance, trying to see if he could, by changing the mood or move order, absorb uh, White's first move. And it hasn't, uh, he hasn't succeeded just yet. Now, uh, but Levy played a tactical idea. He played pawn, takes c5, prompting bishop recaptures on c5. And here we see the idea, a3, wanting to play b4 and kick the bishop, gain a tempo and develop your own bishop on the long diagonal. And we have a very interesting response, just telling us a lot about who Rubinstein was as a player. And someday I should make like a small documentary or something about his life because like it's a wild ride. But he played a6, symmetrical move. Then no surprise, b4, attacking the bishop. The bishop drops back and bishop to b2, develop, white develops the bishop on this light diagonal and is quite happy with himself. The opening skirmish is not over yet. We see the small, subtle way that Akiba outclassed his opponent and went on to outclass almost everybody in the world. When Akiba had uh, fully matured as a player, he would uh, be among the three strongest players in the world. The, st the three strongest players were Lasker, Capablanca, 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 and Akiva. And they all had that thing in common, that if you look at their games with a modern uh, perspective, with a modern chess engine, you don't find those blunders that you see in all other old games. Because they had dug deeper into chess than even anybody before them and they had found something about the truth about chess something about how it's meant to be played if you want to play it correctly in this position Akiva Rubinstein castled so it is good to castle it's good to castle early a hidden sort of a hidden sort of bonus often you can get by castling is that it is a waiting move so you do all the nice stuff you tuck your king away it's a prophylactic good positional move that you will be happy that you made later but it also gives you a sort of a window to see what your opponent is going to do because often the castling move can be detached from the tactical reality in the center of the board. And that is what we saw here. So, so now, queen to d2. And that was met by, like, I love this move. It's so, so subtle. Queen e7 so if you contrast these two moves i mean we are mere mortals so it's probably not obvious it wasn't obvious to me uh, but it became apparent what it was about after studying the game for a number of hours and i'll see if i can s uh, explain it to you how as the game unfolds what it is, what it is that Akiva is doing here. 
it is now white to move again. That's the advantage, right? White starts with the move and all the time uh, you can keep on the advantage being ahead in tempo. Well, what do you want to do now with white? You developed the bishop, the knights, the queen, you want to castle. So you have to develop this bishop. And that is that is the reason that I give a plate this way. So now you have to move this bishop. You move it to d3. And now what can you do with the black pieces? Now you can capture here. You see this idea is not a new idea. We saw this exact idea in this exact game some moves earlier where white did exactly the same thing. White takes. Even on material, white's idea when white did this uh, tactic was to push with b4 and push the bishop back. So this bishop moved back. We do the same. And the bishop moves. But can you see there's something going on here? White started with the move. It's black to move now. Rook to d8 and queen to e7. Bishop b7 and let's take a little bit uh, let's take stock of the situation white castles and how what happened castle king castle king knight queen bishop knight bishop rook but it's black to move and this rook has already moved and it's black's turn. So what happened? There's no cheating going on. It's just that Akiva had found a way to absorb White's, uh, White's initiative, the fact that White was one tempo up, to now black being two tempi. So how amazing is that? How amazing is that? I'll, I'll recommend you go back and look over the game again and see like the small little maneuvers that uh, Black did in order to make this happen. In particular, getting this bishop to move uh, at the right time. So it had to move twice where Black's bishop only had to move once. But I mean, and if this was only that, this game would already be very, very instructive and very, very beautiful. But we're just getting started. This is the positional sort of virtuoso, uh, positional genius part of the game. In a little while, pieces are going to be flying everywhere. And it's going to be just absolutely amazing. So amazing, in fact, that five-time world champion Vishwanathan Anand know this game by heart and used this game and his knowledge of this game to beat Levon Aronian in his own, in Anand's own immortal game. So... I'll talk more about that uh, later, but there is an absolutely amazing connection between this game from uh, 1907 and the Anand Aronian Immortal from 2013. So now that Black has absorbed 
uh, white's opening advantage, it's time to get a little aggressive because now we are ahead in uh, tempos in Tempe. So knight to uh, e5. Knight takes. And bishop takes. And then we saw f4. So white is getting aggressive, saying, you know, this can't be true. You can't be up tempi. I'm going to win my tempi back. I'm going to attack the bishop. I'll ex uh, establish control of the center. And I'll come for you. Okay. Very calmly. Rubinstein just put the bishop back on c7. These two bishops, you know, if you watch some of my other videos, you know that I talk about, you know, that I talk about the power of the two bishops and how their bishop can be a sniper. These two guys, I mean, if there ever was a game to show the power of the long range sniper bishops, this is it. Rod Levy played e4, saying I now have bases for an attack. I control all these center squares. I will come for you. I will attack your king. I will checkmate you. And uh, that little thing you did to me, where you took my opening advantage, and all of a sudden you may waved your magic wand, and then I was uh, too tempy behind as white. We'll forget all about that. Well, will we? Will we? So, like all the great masters, Rubinstein knew that you had to use all of your pieces and leave no resources behind. So, we see rook on A to C8. Now, all the pieces are doing something. White pushed onwards pawn to e5, attacking the knight. So this could be a problem, maybe. But there is a tactical solution. It has to do with the exposed diagonal towards black's king. And it starts with bishop to b6, check, and king. Now the king here, uh, not the king, the knight. It's attacked by the pawn. Where can we put it? Put it here. Well, can be taken. We can eh, maybe here. No, doesn't work. How about to g4? That's a slick, slick move. So of course. It's not protected. We could capture with the queen. This is possible. But you have to contend with that you are no longer defending this uh, that this bishop. And can you see how these two bishops are just very dangerous? And this rook is now attacking this knight along with this rook. You have no attack. This bishop is very important because it's the one that could look out from the bunker and snipe along the light squares, whereas the dark squared bishop here is the bad bishop trapped behind these pawns and not uh, able to participate anytime soon in an attack against the king. So that does not really work. We can't really capture the knight but the queen. Okay. Then what? Then what can we do? How about getting the bishop out of harm's way? Also sort of shutting this bishop down, threatening to take it. If we take here, we can get a strong knight now and get it close to the king. So that would be a worthy way for this bishop. 
And now, guys, now is the time for the fireworks. Now this is, this is all sound. You can put this through Stockfish and it'll just say, yep, yep, yep. That is exactly how to win this position. Uh, it's, a, it's a perfect game. There's like no mistakes at all from Akiva's side. Queen to h4. This is, of course, threatening checkmate. And uh, that has to be dealt with. So we can't really, can't really do anything about this tension between the bishops here. And um, we have to figure out what to do about this. And Rodley, we found a way that just looks really, really slick and cool and effective. You play g3. Now the queen protects h2, so there is no checkmate. We are also threatening the queen that wins a tempo so that we can, right after the queen moves, we can chop this bishop off and uh, we'll be winning. So the only problem here is he's playing Rubinstein. And if your base of your plan is that you have figured out something about uh, Tempe, and you think that Rubinstein has not figured that out, and you think that he has not <laughs> calculated further than you regarding Tempe, well, then that plan is not going to work out so well for you. So, um, yeah, so this move and the concept coming up now is just amazing. And, um, and yeah, this with these two bishops and the queen attacking the king and this particular uh, attacking concept was used by the still living chess legend Vishwanathan Anand in 2013. I'll put the link to my video on that beautiful game in the description. The move is about unleashing the power of these two bishops. Because yes, we have we have a um, checkmating attack here by the queen. But you can see these two bishops are actually, if this wasn't here, it would almost be checkmate. Can you see that? No, they are just slicing through down towards the king. So what we can do is we can take this rook and we can take this knight. Okay. So that knight had a very important role. It was defending this bishop. Now only the queen is defending this bishop. But the bishop is still defended. So obviously we capture the queen. And I mean, finding rook takes knight, that's already tough. But the way to justify it, can you find it? What, what's the way to justify it? Only one move. This whole, this whole concept, the whole idea of coming here with the knight in the first place is, is based on this concept. So the clue is this bishop protected. You don't want that bishop to be protected. So what can you do? You can play rook to d2. So if you move the queen to still protect the bishop, then rook takes h2 is checkmate because you can't go here because of the sniper bishop, can take the rook, it's defended by the knight. So, and if you go here, I can of course just uh, capture the, the queen. Uh, maybe I probably even just take with the rook first, 
that'll be check i'll move and then i'll capture with with check and it'll be soon be checkmate so so the only thing you can do is to capture the book but i mean you are up a bunch of material and also it's not like perfectly clear how black is winning if you are well if you're somebody like me who who is still just a chess fan but not not the same kind of person that like like these guys who could play the immortals i'm a very mortal <laughs> chess fan i could find of course bishop takes bishop check but it's not checkmate because i can interpose the th the queen and if i capture the queen they will recapture my bishop and i will be left i'll be down a bunch of material i will have no compensation this rook is attacked i will be losing that game the thing is though that this queen is pinned to the king so the queen is not protecting h2 and do you remember the we had this cool checkmating idea by with capturing with a rook on h2 that would be checkmate because you couldn't go here because of the sniper bishop and the queen is actually not defending h2 so Wolfenstein just played rook h3 imagine the satisfaction of playing a move like that over the board like this whole thing and you just say yep yeah. you have a million moves but there is no way to defend h2 there's no way you can do it like if you capture this bishop this is of course free you can capture the bishop but it's checkmate here and um there's, there's just no way like this bishop there's no way it can get over there so it's checkmate in one now when no matter what you do i will play rook takes and it's checkmate so rod levy resigned and that is the game just an absolutely fantastic game so i hope you enjoyed it i hope you will join me for the next video um yeah thanks for watching